Welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, uh, this is the session on philosophy. Our topic will be how is knowledge established and what constitutes valid reasoning. Our speakers this afternoon are John Durant and Sonam Chopal. The panelists will be Lob Sangampo and Julie Haas. John will begin. Thank you, Your Holiness. It's wonderful to be here again and an honor to speak to you and to this audience. I have just had the pleasure of having lunch with you, Your Holiness, and I realize we had a very good lunch. So my problem is great. I have to try to interest you in this difficult hour of the day. And everybody else maybe has had lunch too, so I will do my best. I have been asked to speak to a modest subject, whoops, which is, what is science? And uh, I'm going to follow very much the line that Michelle Bitpol took this morning, and I would have liked to use the quotation from Albert Einstein with which he began, or with which he almost concluded, namely that if we want to understand science, perhaps we should look at what scientists do, and not quite so much at what they say that they do. And that is going to be the way that I will approach this subject. Scientists, it's true, do a lot of different things. Some are in laboratories, some are out in the field. As you see in this image, some go underwater, some even send uh, devices to the moon and to other planets. Science involves many different activities. But when we try to understand science as a whole, we find that it's difficult. And that's partly because there are a lot of stories, I will call them myths, about the nature of science, which do not help us. Uh, and I'm going to talk briefly about three different myths or stories about science, which I think are not very helpful, before I try to summarize what I think would be a more helpful approach. So the first thing I want to talk about is the myth of scientific certainty. And this is the most appealing myth of all, because we all know how powerful and how influential science is. Uh, I have in my pocket uh, some uh, a medicine prescribed to me on the basis of science, uh, without which I would not survive. So I have to take this every day. I have complete confidence in taking this because I trust that the science on which this is based is correct, and it seems to keep me alive. So I'm grateful. Nevertheless, I still want to suggest No, <laughs> sir, you're right. Uh, my survival is based on many things, including the excellent food that you give us. <laughs> but this is one of the things on which, as it happens, my, my survival is based. I won't go into why, but just to illustrate that we all trust science, or many of us do, a lot. And it's easy to think that perhaps what science tells us is so... Uh, so successful that it must be certain, that scientific knowledge must be beyond dispute. And I want to explain why I think a lot of people feel like that and also why I think that is wrong. So I will use an example that has been used already in this meeting. This is a portrait of Isaac Newton, perhaps the most important scientist of the 17th and early 18th centuries. Newton is famous for establish, establishing some laws of motion and his principle of universal gravitation. And one of the famous things that his laws do is to explain many different things at once. So in the same principles, we, he can understand famously how an apple falls on his head and how the moon is held in its orbit around the sun. And it is sometimes said that Newton's principles took men to the moon because the Apollo project had to use Newton's laws of motion to help calculate the path to take. 
and I believe all that is true. It is also true, however, that we know, and we heard it said this morning, that much later, at just after the turn of the 20th century, Albert Einstein came along and actually reinterpreted some of the same things that Newton had explained through his laws, and he even reinterpreted gravitation. So the thing for which Newton is most famous came to be understood in a quite different way. Uh, it turns out that in the everyday world, Einstein's predictions from his theory of gravity are more or less the same as Newton's, so you can still use Newton's laws to go to the moon. But the thing that is interesting to me is that Einstein's principles changed the most basic assumptions about what gravity is. Gravity is not understood in the same way at all in Einstein's general theory of relativity. And many people, including me, have come to feel that if you can change Newton, if in a certain sense Newton can be shown to have been wrong, then anything in science can be shown to be wrong. If we asked a, science, a scientist in the 19th century, what is the most certain science you have, they would almost certainly have said Newton's laws. That, that was right at the pinnacle of science. And yet, now, it's been changed. And this happens... Okay. So this happens in many areas, and it happens in quite uh, everyday areas. So I want to use one more example, which is very different from Newton's laws of motion. This is a living thing that many people here may have seen. The English word for this organism is lichen. It can be found growing on trees and on sidewalks sometimes. I looked for some around Mundgod. I hoped to bring some, but I could not find any. I apologize. So why do I show this? Biologists uh, have been taught for many years that lichen is a very unusual living thing because it's made of two other living things that have come together. It's made of a, a plant which is called an alga, green plants which you can find growing in ponds and all over. And it's a close relationship between an alga and a fungus, a thing more like a mushroom, which come to live in permanent relationship close together. So every textbook of biology on this subject for nearly a hundred years has said that that is what a lichen is. Until last year. So last year, this person, uh, a scientist working in America, published a paper with some other colleagues in which they closely studied lichens from many different parts of the world and they found that there is a third organism. This is not two together. I can't do it. I only have two hands. Three together in this thing. There is also a yeast. The yeast is the microorganism that is well known because it's used in baking bread uh, and so on. So it turns out that we were wrong for almost 100 years in saying that lichens are a symbiosis of two things. It turns out, it seems that all lichens are probably a symbiosis of three things. So this is relatively routine in science, and it is actually seen as, as a good thing. It means we are improving our knowledge. But the very fact that you improve your knowledge means that you have to hold your knowledge with a certain amount of provisionality. You have to, be, you have to hold your knowledge lightly. You should not grasp it too strongly because it might have to be changed and then you're in trouble. So this is why very distinguished scientists, that's just a quote, we don't need to stop with that. Very distinguished scientists have sometimes observed this. This is the late Richard Feynman, very distinguished American physicist. And he wrote 
that scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, none absolutely certain. So I think this is a very important feature of science. We should forget the myth of scientific certainty. However confident we can be in the claims of science, we always know they can be improved and they may need to be changed. That's my first point. The second myth I want to look at is the myth of scientific method. And I think I may even disagree with some of my eminent colleagues around the table here. We will, dis we will find this out in discussion. But I think that some unhelpful things are said about this thing called the scientific method. I just pulled this up off the internet, and here's a set of words that are associated with the notion of scientific method. You will hear people talk often about the scientific method, and they will describe it in different ways, but commonly, this is just one, again, I pulled this from the internet, there are hundreds of representations of the scientific method on the internet. And you see that it starts with a theory. Sometimes people start with a hypothesis. It makes a prediction. You do an experiment. You make an observation. And you either confirm or you change your theory. And you will hear this said often. You will also see this experimental idea of the scientific method um, represented in public. So here is a, an old science fiction movie, if you like. This is Boris Karloff uh, playing the role of Dr. Frankenstein in an, a Hollywood movie, and he's doing some elaborate experiment. So why would I object to this way of talking about science? My only problem with this is it implies that there is one single unique way of doing science. And I do not accept that. I, don't, I think if you look at what scientists do, and not just at what they say they do, this is an example where you see that they do many different things, and doing experiments is only one of them. So what about our friends in optical astronomy, who have made huge progress in understanding the nature of the universe by studying the sky at night, but Mainly, mainly, they have done this by making very detailed, close observation. They can't really do experiments on the stars, not easily. And the same is true in the study of fossils. So paleontologists who've told us a great deal about the history of life on Earth, studying dinosaurs and extinct reptiles and so on, they generally don't use the experimental method. They use other methods. So I would prefer us to start talking about scientific methods rather than the scientific method. And in fact, a number of philosophers have noted that when you look at what scientists do, this is one rather notorious gentleman called Paul Feyerabend. He just is confirming that when you look at the history of science, you find many different methods being used and no conformity to this myth of a single method. Now, my last, myth, my last myth is the most delicate of all, because I want to criticize the myth that scientists... So I, just, I now want to criticize the myth of what I call the objective scientist. You will often hear people, now of course I want to accept or exclude all my colleagues here, the scientists here, they are all exceptional individuals and they are all <laughs> very objective, Your Holiness. Um, but they are not necessarily typical of all scientists. Uh, when we look at scientists as a whole, I don't think we can honestly say that all scientists are completely objective. We have a number of wonderful historical stories which talk about the objective scientist. Here is a portrait of Galileo, the Italian uh, natural philosopher, before the Spanish Inquisition, when he was forced to give up his belief 
that the earth goes round the sun. And it is said that he did give up the belief, but then when he left, whispered uh, and in Italian, and yet it moves, and yet it moves. So you can force me to say something different, but I will say the truth, because I'm objective. And we have myths about the objective scientist in science fantasy. So this, for anybody here who has watched Star Trek, is Mr. Spock, who is um, a member of, the spe of a species from the planet Vulcan. And this is one quotation from Mr. Spock. May I say that I have not thoroughly enjoyed serving with humans. I find their illogic and foolish emotions a constant irritant. So this is Mr. Spock in Star, in Star Trek plays the role of the objective scientist. He has no emotions, he sees things objectively, and somehow he's pointing out that ordinary human beings don't. And I want to suggest that scientists are ordinary human beings. So scientists, too, have a hard time always being objective. Sometimes they can be, sometimes they are not. I'm going to just use one example from current science. So this is a rather um, unclear image, but it's about a very important new form of gene uh, editing known as CRISPR. Uh, you see the letters C-R-I-S-P-R -R up there, it's CRISPR-Cas9. It's uh, a very important discovery of the last few years. And the discovery is associated with several scientists. This is one, this is Professor Eric Lander. I think you have met Professor Lander your holiness on some previous occasions. Uh, and Landa wrote an article recently describing all the different places in the world where research had been done that was important for the discovery of uh, this gene editing technology. But his article provoked outrage, and there has been an extraordinary argument going on. Here is another uh, scientist called Michael Eisen commenting on Lander's article. This is, he says, science propaganda at its most repellent. Eric Lander and the Broad Institute should be ashamed of themselves. Now, why is he saying this? Because there is currently a dispute about who really is responsible and who should take the credit for this important scientific discovery priority disputes, as they're called, are very common in science. And it's very rare to see scientists involved in a priority dispute who behave objectively, because their own reputations, their own careers, maybe their students' reputations or their lab. In the case of CRISPR, there's a lot of money involved. Um, there are patents already for this discovery, and people will make millions of dollars out of this discovery. So you don't expect people to behave objectively when careers and wealth are at stake. And indeed, they often do not. So, why are we so subject to myths about science? I want to say there's a very straightforward answer, and it's a, it points us in the direction of a better understanding of the nature of science. And for the last few minutes, I will be more constructive. The problem with these myths is that they focus on individual scientists who, and what they do, their individual methods and the certainty of the results that come. But actually, if you look at what scientists do, one thing that's immediately obvious is that scientists don't do their work on their own. The notion that science is the result of the work of lone geniuses, very smart giraffes, apparently, this is, a, this is itself the biggest myth. Science is done by many giraffes working together. And the most distinctive feature of science is that it is a community, just as a monastic community is a community. The scientific community is a community dedicated to producing the best knowledge and understanding that it can of the natural world. 
So as soon as we look at what scientists do, we see people doing things together, often in large numbers. Here is something that every scientist will recognize. It's a poster session in a big scientific conference. And the people you see, Your Holiness, standing in front of these big posters are junior researchers who are summarizing their work and what they have discovered up to this point on these posters. And people come and they argue about whether this is right or whether that's the right way of doing it or whether it's worth doing at all. This is a very important step in the path of a scientific career. So in closing, I want to suggest that we need to think about science much more as something that is the result of the combined efforts of many people. Uh, you don't get science from a single individual on their own, in my view. Scientists are trained just as artisans or skilled workers in any other field are trained. And one thing they're trained in is their responsibility to other researchers. They are responsible for reporting their work as well and as clearly as they can. They're responsible for publishing their work openly. You, you cannot be a successful scientist in the conventional sense if you do everything in secret. You are responsible also for acting as a critic of other colleagues' work. Every scientist is called upon to, it's called peer review, they're called upon to read the research of their colleagues before it's published and make criticisms if they can see it. And it's through this interplay between a community of knowledge producers that we get the reliability that we so associate with modern science. I trust these pills because, among other things, they have been subjected to very critical scrutiny. Scientists have done experiments, and others have then had to check whether the experiments were true or reliable. And for that reason, I suggest the best way to understand science is to think about it, my first question, as a global culture. It's a culture that stretches right around the world, it takes no notice of people's nationality or their cultural backgrounds. Actually, it takes no notice of their religious beliefs. It simply asks, are you willing to contribute? Are you able to contribute successfully to this culture of creating reliable knowledge about the natural world? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you Uh, good afternoon, Your Holiness. For me, doing this presentation in your, in your presence, in the presence of so many renowned scholars and scientists, is the biggest honor for my life. And this, this was made possible by your constant inspiration and uh, support. And I, on behalf of the, the whole monastic community of students, would like to express our deepest gratitude and admir admiration for your profound vision and encouragement. As a new student, I'm bound to make many mistakes in my presentation, so I ask your forgiveness and the forgiveness of my teachers for any limitations on my part in, doing <coughs> in presenting some of the Buddhist ideas pertaining to the theory of knowledge. 
I think to build a meaningful bridge between Buddhist science and Western science, it is necessary for the two sides to learn about each other's fundamental concepts and define features. As such, I would try to present some of the basic Buddhist concepts about knowledge, like how it is, how knowledge is generated and produced, and how 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 is uh, how it is validified. <coughs> As the the the, the title suggests, my main topic for this pre presentation is the Buddhist theory of knowledge, but there are several other topics, points that I want to talk, I would like to talk about in this presentation. So, first I would like to present a brief outline of Buddhism. We have among the, the audience people from many different intellectual, cultural, cultural and uh, religious backgrounds and uh, such an outline I think may provide uh, them with helpful information in understanding our sub subsequent talks. I also hope that, that it will provide a basis for our discussions that are followed. So, about the, the, the introduction of the, the Buddhism, a brief introduction of Buddhism, I, want, I would like to start it with a question. And uh, the question is, what is Buddhism? So this is a, a big question, and there are, of course, <clears throat> many ways to answer this question. And uh, till today, different scholars have tried to answer this question in their own ways. Your Holiness, you have been teaching us about Buddhism having three components namely Buddhist religion, Buddhist philosophy, and Buddhist science. And our understanding understand is it is the last two components of Buddhism that are the Buddhist philosophy component and Buddhist science component that are comparable with Western science. During the subsequent sessions, my fellow monastic presenters we'll be talking about several topics, primarily drawn from Buddhist science. And so, mm -hmm, I'm sorry. I, I would like to address the question, above question, what is Buddhism, based on one of the most oftenly quoted verses from a sutra. Buddha says that his teachings are all geared towards taming our mind. He says, I quote, do, do not commit any non-virtue, cultivate virtues to the utmost. Tame one's mind to the fullest. This is the teaching of a Buddha. <coughs> the first two lines of this verse deal with the two fundamental points of Buddhist philosophy, and the third line is about taming our minds through methods of contemplative practices, which is a primary point in Buddhist science, I think. A state of fully tamed mind is the state of Buddhahood, which primarily is de dealt with in Buddhist religion component. So in this short verse, the Buddha has already taught us about the three different components of the Buddhism. So if taming Taming of our mind is what Buddhism is all about, then how do we achieve that? How should we approach our world so as to achieve that? Taming one's mind is possible only by eliminating the different, type, different types of inflictive emotions, which are rooted in the, rooted in the ignorance, of, ignorance of reality. So to dispel this ignorance, one needs to do thorough and reliable inquiries. So this, this leads me to the, to the method of doing inquiry in the Buddhism, which involves what are known as the four reliances. The, the, the four are rely on the teachings, not on not the person, rely on the meaning, not just the words, rely on the definitive meaning, not the provisional word, rely on the exalted wisdom, not the ordinary thoughts. 
So since we should rely on the teaching, not on the person, we must investigate if what the person or the master has taught is in accordance with the reality, which means not accepting the teaching merely out of faith or respect. As such, a master's words should be put under thorough investigation. And only if one has a sound, sound reason or evidence to establish a point, then, only after then, the point is accepted in Buddhism. Buddha himself has taught us not to accept his words <clears throat> merely out of faith or respect for him, but rather put them under three different investigations. In one of his teachings, he said, the Buddha said, just as a goldsmith assays or checks gold by rubbing, cutting, and burning, so should you, my followers, examine my words. Do not accept them just out of respect for me. So this shows the value of empirical investigations in finding the truth. As such, I think these this methods, the Buddhist methods of inquiry, resonates very well with the scientific, the scientific method or scientific methods, as John would put. And uh, all the... So, all the above-mentioned above theories are used for the sole purpose of gaining knowledge of the world, or of the reality, and the concept of knowledge, in my, my opinion, is a point where Buddhist science and Western science diverge fundamentally. In Western science, as we have heard, just heard from Professor John Durant, Knowledge is always uncertain and infos, uh, falsifiable. And, uh, but on the other hand, in the Buddhist science, as we see in these citations, knowledge is asserted to be certain and infallible. So I hope during the panel, after, the, after this presentation, there will be discussions regarding how to approach such divergent Divergent, divergent points between these two different traditions, namely Buddhist science and Western science. So, Ajaya Dignaga and Dharmakirti, two of the greatest Buddhist masters, describes two aspects of the infallible nature of knowledge. Infallibility in terms of fulfilling one's short and long-term purposes, and infallibility in terms of eliminating ignorance of the real nature of phenomena. As such, by means of infallible knowledge, one should achieve one's purposes. As to what purposes one could have, three domains of knowledge are, yeah, three domains of knowledge are discussed in the Buddhist texts. Uh, the, the three Buddhist texts, the three are so this, I, this picture, I put it there to, uh, to, to give a very simple example of how an infallible, uh, an infallible knowledge is uh, necessary to, to, to achieve one's purpose. So when we see, uh, uh, it's animated, but it's not working, but when we see the, the first, uh, first, first jar of what you call it, Nutella, and uh, a person who, who really liked Nutella would go approach that and try to, try to pick it up. And, but in reality, that's a drawing of a jar of Nutella. So it's that, that's a, a simple, I think it's a too, simpli, too simplified uh, example, but it's a, I'm trying to show the, how this uh, infallibility nature is important in the, in in in, in uh, achieving one's purpose, uh, so yeah, and uh, in Buddhism, the, the the there are three domains of knowledge, which are the manifest object. Oh, I'm sorry. Manifest uh, manifest object, slightly hidden and extremely hidden domains. The first two domains of knowledge could be subject. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. 
The first two domains of knowledge could be subjects of scientific investigation, but the third domain is the, as His Holiness always uh, teaches us, is the investigative subject of Buddhist religion only. I do not know how relevant it is here, but in our community here, the notion that Western science deals only with the, the, the first type of dom, uh, uh, domain of knowledge, which is the manifest, manifest objects, is very uh, pretty common here, that, that notion. So I, I hope that through dialogues such as this one, we eliminate such uh, minor and other ma major misunderstanding of each other and uh, be more appreciative of each other. <clears throat> yeah. Now that I have talked about a little bit about the concept of in, an infallible knowledge and, and its three objective domains, I would like to talk a little bit about the two types of knowledge that are defined in Buddhism and how they are engaged, how they, they engage with their objects. The two types of knowledge are knowledge are the knowledge that is direct perception and inferential. The other one is inferential knowledge. Yeah, the, the, uh, sometimes they translate it as inference, but, uh, and sometimes inferential knowledge. So I'm using the inferential knowledge, the, the word, the, the term here. Direct percent, perception is defined as. Uh, okay, I'm on the right slide. Direct perception is defined as a non-conceptual, no distorted consciousness. Inferential knowledge is a conceptual consciousness derived from, derived from sound reasoning. And uh, so there are two ways in which knowledge engages these two different types of knowledge, engage with their, uh, with their, with, with their objects. Uh, the, the, these two ways are inclusive engagement and exclusive engagement. Direct perception, well, we, 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 uh, direct perception, yeah, engages with its knowledge, or with its uh, object inclusively, meaning that it does not engage selectively or by way of separating the objects into parts. Whereas inferential knowledge is a conceptual thought which engages with its object exclusively. Conceptual thoughts need a generic image, which is in Tibetan is Tunji, a generic image of their objects as a medium of engagement with their objects. And uh, I'm sorry, I forget to do it. Uh, now, let me go back. Uh, earlier, we defined uh, the, the direct perception as a non-conceptual, non-distorted consciousness, and uh, that definition was of, was of two, two, two parts. And now let me go back to the second part of the definition of uh, direct perception, which is no-distortedness. In general, there are two types of causes of distortion. There are the circumstantial cause and the deep-seated cause of distortion. The five sensory consciousnesses are uh, distorted by circumstantial cause of distortion. An example would be the perception of movements of movement of trees and housings when one is traveling in a vehicle in a train. train. And uh, the, the, the last part of my short presentation, the last point I want to, uh, I would like to talk about the line of reasoning from which inferential knowledge is derived. Buddhist epistemology asserts that an infallible inferential knowledge is generated only by a sound reason, which is defined as a line of reasoning which fulfills three modes. <coughs> three modes. The establishment of the concept of per perversion is possible only if one is able to establish a necessary, necessary connection or a relation between the reason and the predicate. Ajaya Dharmakirti says, 
says, I quote, there must exist a viable relationship or a necessary connection wherein the absence of one necessarily entails the absence of the other. Until this is the case, the reason cannot ensure the reason. And the Buddhist epistemology asserts the existence of two types of necessary connections or the two, the two different types of relations. It also asserts that because there exists a necessary connection between fire and the smoke, the existence of fire pervades the, pervades the existence of a smoke, and therefore, smoke could be a sound reason to inf infer the existence of fire. I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, the necessary connection between this, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, fire and uh, smoke, because yesterday, the, the philosophy group, we had a uh, meeting in the afternoon, and uh, we talked about this uh, causal relationship between fire and uh, um, uh, between fire and the smoke, and also we talked about the detail the and uh, I thought this could be a really interesting topic for this afternoon's uh, uh, the panel discussion. So uh, I'm mentioning this uh, this year. So and uh, so that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you very much, Your Holiness. Thank you, everybody. Okay, the, our two panelists will now uh, make short uh, remarks. Um, uh, Love saying will begin. Your Holiness, uh, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to express my greatest grat and deepest gratitude from, from my heart. And uh, it is an honor for me to be in front of you and uh, uh, to highlight some of the uh, potentially interesting um, topics that my fellow colleague uh, had just presented on. And, uh, and I also would like to um, extend these questions to the larger audiences that have got, gathered here today. Uh, and. Uh, before going that, I would like to um, go into some of the historical um, uh, historical points of uh, um, Indian uh, pramana theory. So some of some of the Indian uh, pramana theorists earlier uh, earlier pramana theorists had different views on um, uh, reasoning. Uh, some of some Indian uh, schools. Uh, asserted only one type of knowledge, which is the direct perception. Uh, they did not um, um, believe in inference. They said that some of them said that inference is like a blindly walking on a dangerous path. Uh, 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 and uh, the absolute knowledge, some of the schools asserted that the absolute knowledge is the, um, uh, what they call Vedic texts, uh, the things that are, are written in the Vedic texts. Uh, but later, Pramana theorists asserted that uh, they, there is second type of knowledge, inference, and um, Later on, Buddhists um, Buddhist developed their own uh, theory of inference. Um, and uh, as my colleague uh, presented earlier, uh, Buddhist theory of inference is based on three modes of um, uh, investigation, which are the... Thank uh, you, um, ...property of the subject, the forward pervasion, and the counter pervasion. And I would like to focus on the last two part of this uh, three modes, which is the forward pervasion and the counter pervasion. And this leads to the, uh, some of the points that uh, Dr. Um, J. 
Durant made during his presentation, which is the uncertainty of uh, scientific knowledge. And uh, before going that, I'd like to make a little clarification on the very on this on the word uh, on the meaning of the word certainty, and uh, what we what we use in Tibetan language as sometimes um, we use it melua or infallibility, or sometimes we refer to it as nyeba, tsiming nyeba, or uh, which is roughly translated as certainty, but. Uh, this is the, uh, I, I want to leave as an open discussion because uh, in Tibetan Nyeba, does it really necessarily exclude all the, uh, uh, all the possibilities that it might be wrong or does it mean uh, like the highest probability uh, or like maybe 80% uh, or 90%? So here we talk about probability which was never mentioned in Buddhist um, uh, epistemology. epistemology. And uh, I would like to uh, raise some of the qu uh, potentially interesting questions for the larger gathering of the monks around here that um, regarding the last two uh, modes, uh, which is the pervasion, uh, and so uh, positive pervasion means that you have to establish uh, certainty between evidence, uh, you have to establish um, pervasion of the evidence over predicate in order to establish a general law of phenomena. So for example, uh, if you want to know that uh, all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, you have to establish uh, the pervasion of conditioned phenomena over impermanent. And uh, in, in that case, uh, in, there was a great discussion and debate between different uh, Pramana theorists uh, uh, between Buddhist Pramana theories and uh, earlier um, other schools and as well as uh, some other Buddhist schools uh, as well, whether you have to check every, each and every uh, evidence to establish the pervasion of uh, evidence over predicate. And some of the schools uh, said that yes, you do have to establish, uh, you, you do have to check each and every case of evidence to establish the pervasion. However, Dignaga and Dharmakirti uh, came up with a new idea that you don't have to check each and every case of uh, evidence uh, in order to establish uh, the pervasion of evidence over predicate. For example, if you want to establish that um, all conditioned phenomena are impermanent, do you have to check each and every case of conditioned things? For example, if you want to establish um, a good example we talked about yesterday was a circle. So let's take an example of s science. So in order to establish that uh, circle has a ratio to its uh, diameter uh, as 3.14 in etc., do you have to check each and every circle to establish this pervasion? Or is there some other way to establish? And um, that Dignaga and Dharmakirti seems to have came up, uh, come up with this new idea that uh, no, you don't have to check, check each and every case, but by establishing the relation between evidence and predicate, you can uh, probably not 100% certainty, but maybe a higher, high level of certainty of uh, pervasion over the uh, pervasion of the evidence over predicate. So for example, without checking each and every case of conditioned phenomena, you can establish pervasion uh, of all conditioned phenomena over uh, the predicate, which is impermanent. And I would like to open this uh, point as an, uh, I would like to uh, leave this point as an open uh, discussion and uh, please join us. Thank you. Our second panelist is Judy Haas. Thank you. Um, so I think um, what I'm going to try and do is um, bring a little bit of clarity to some of the concepts that we've talked about. I think if we're going to compare Buddhist and Western notions of inference 
and pervasion um, and certainty and reliability, um, then we have to get a little bit clearer sometimes about what we mean by those. Um, and I thank my colleagues for what they've said so far. Um, I'm going to focus on the scientific notions um, of certainty and reliability. Um, so to that end, I'd like to raise a couple of questions um, and also make some suggestions. Um, so my first question um, that I think we should clarify a little bit, and hopefully we can do that in the discussion, um, is what we mean by reliability. Um, so Professor Durand um, argued convincingly, I think, that science is not in the business of producing certain knowledge, but is in the business of producing reliable knowledge. Um, and I think that's a, a pretty straightforward claim that we can all accept. I think I would, I would wager that many scientists would agree um, about the certainty claim, and, and many philosophers would agree with that as well. Um, but I don't think we want to leave it there. Um, I think we need to know a little bit more about what we mean by reliable knowledge. Um, it's a very loaded term, and if we're going to compare it to degrees of knowing um, and degrees of certainty in Buddhist knowledge, we need to be quite clear about what we mean when we say that scientific knowledge is reliable. Um, and you can mean a lot of different things by that, and I won't get into those there, but I think I want to suggest and I want to press um, a little bit um, the idea that reliability um, has something to do with, if not knowing what is right about the world or true about the world, um, there is a sense that scientists are on the right track, um, that we're heading in the right direction. Um, and if that's right, if there is a sort of truth aspect or a right aspect to science, um, then the second important question is, what is it about science that gives it this reliability? And obviously, we're going to have to flesh it out much more. But um, what I want to focus on is what is it about science that um, gives it this sense that we are on the right path, that our theories are getting better? Um, and here I'm going to actually kind of spend most of my, uh, my time defending the scientific method. Um, because I think it's true that there are lots of different techniques in science. Some scientists go underwater. Some scientists look into space. Um, but I would argue that um, what all scientists have in common, and e even cognitive scientists or philosophers who are interested in science have in common, um, is commitment to the scientific method, which I would describe in the following way. And we saw a chart of that, um, which is something like generating theories, um, deriving predictions from those theories, and then testing them um, either by using experiments or through other means of observation. Um, and I think actually all scientists, I would argue, have that in common. They have that commitment um, to observation, or what I would call prediction, um, and then sort of error updating, right? We, we interact with the world to try and see whether our predictions about the world are right. Now, I would grant that there are scientists in the world who um, developed theories and were never able to test them, um, either for pragmatic reasons or, or political reasons. So not every scientist um, is able to develop a theory and test it and then update it, right? Um, and conversely, there are also scientists, uh, there are famous cases of scientists who um, made critical observations about the world. And here I'm thinking about Tycho de Brahe, and I'd like to thank um, Dr. Aaron Bonning for sort of fact-checking me on this one, um, who made really important observations, um, astronomical observations, um, without necessarily having uh, the, Kepler, the Kepler model of the solar system in mind. And so despite having the theory, despite trying to bear out his own theory, his observations were then used um, to bear out an independent theory. And so it's true that in individual cases, observation and um, theory can come apart. But I think the broader scientific project, and I think what does grant science that particular power, um, is that sort of ongoing relationship between predictions um, errors in our predictions, and then updating our predictions forward. And that's kind of what keeps us on the steady path. Um, and I think for a philosopher, if what we want to do is to sort of harness science, I think philosophers share this a little bit um, with Buddhism in that um, we see our domain as a little bit broader. So as a cognitive scientist and as a philosopher, I want to not only understand how things work, but I want to sort of use and abuse that knowledge of how things work to, to my own ends, maybe to, to tame the mind or to live a better life, um, then I think it's really important to understand exactly what makes science um, that powerful. And I think, I think that is, in fact, um, the scientific method, which is then carried out by communities of scientists. Um, but there's something really special about that kind of carving, um, carving at the joints. So thank you. Now, you're holding this. I have an apology. I, it was my mistake. I, I said we had two panelists. We have three panelists. Our third panelist is Sonam Wonchuk, 
please. Uh, I have feeling uh, uh, at the moment there's a two principal, uh, two principal, uh, one is Dr. Uh, Duran, or Lord, so, uh, scholar Sonam. Um, maybe uh, uh, what I have feel is a like, little bit uh, misunderstanding. Uh, I feel like there's a little bit of contradiction uh, between uh, Buddhist epistemological system and scientific method or scientific knowledge. As you mentioned, uh, Doctor, in your paper yesterday, I uh, read full paper, uh, which is sent by the uh, Carol Beck. Also, in, this, uh, in the paper you mentioned, there, uh, if, if we say the scientific knowledge is certain, certainty, this is misunderstanding, am I right? Uh, if, if we say, the scientific knowledge is a certainty, then it, is it become the misunderstood, you know? Someone say the scientific knowledge is uh, unchangeable, like say very... Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm saying that you should be worried if anybody claims that a piece of scientific knowledge is completely certain mm -hmm. and can never exactly. be revised. I would say you should worry about that. Exactly, yeah. okay, right. Uh, also in the motion the Carol mentioned the science is always question, not answer. Like this is a very uh, uh, good summarize, I thought. So through Buddhist epistemological system, do we have a uh, hope to get scientists to uh, scientists the valid, uh, valid cognition or in, Sans in Sanskrit called Brahman? I think for my feeling, I think it's not possible to get scientists to get a valid cognition through the scientific method because they're always changing, not rely on. The <laughs> so I feel like this. So uh, can you say something? Uh, uh, say some, uh, some something about this. So, uh, so uh, last, let me request you one during. Uh, do you have uh, example, specific example? You say there's uh, some scientist. They, uh, even though we called the scientists, but they did not do experiment. Do you have some? Do we have examples of what? Uh, scientists, those kind of scientists, they did not any experiment, but we call those who are scientists. Yeah, yes, there are lots of scientists who've had whole careers and they've never done an experiment in their lives. Oh, wow. Oh. Yes, and there, and there are others who do nothing but experiments. They do experiments every day. You have everything in between these two. Uh -huh. Usually the monks, or I'm, for me also, this, anyone who is a scientist, the scientist must be come through the experiment, analysis. But you say there's a with scientist, those kind of scientists did not do any experiment, is it? Well, I, I'm just trying to say that, that, that depend, depending on which subject you are interested in, you have to pick a method that suits your subject. Mm -hmm. So if you're studying the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, which we believe happened about 65 million years ago, mm -hmm. you, you may do all kinds of things that don't require experiment. You may, you may need to go and collect evidence or compare data from around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just one example. So methods are <laughs> developed by scientists to suit the problem that they study. They don't simply go to a book and say, I must use this method. Mm -hmm. No, that's not how scientists behave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here's my yeah. 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 Excellent, thank you so much. I think you have um, uh, pointed out one of the central issues in the in intersection or the, con or the uh, contact between the epistemology that is part of science and the epistemology that is, is Buddhism has developed. And that is, the, I can even put the question as, does valid cognition require certainty? Or can we get some valid cognition without certainty? Because it seems like science clearly, I think it's indisputable among scientists and philosophers of science for the most part, uh, that science will not yield certainty. It, Whatever our conclusions are, even our, our most firm conclusions, it's possible that we will continue to try to find ways in which they, we might undermine them. Um, 
So I, I think the, the, the first topic to, to breach here is what, what do we mean by certainty? What sort of certainty might Buddhist epistemology require? Or what, or, uh, I think that was uh, nicely raised by Lobsang's uh, remarks. C can we back off Dharmakirti, the stronger claims Dharmakirti makes, or, or not? Right? And then, what does certainty amount, or, or are, well, we have knowledge that comes short of certainty in the sciences, what does that amount to? How, st how strong is it? What is the reliability uh, or not? I think that's a, a central set of questions in the contact between Western science and, and Buddhist epistemology. The floor is open. Yeah. So uh, I would like to um, go a little bit on um, what we mean by uncertainty of scientific theories. And uh, when, when scientists usually say scientific uh, theory, they usually mean some um, maybe um, formula or some kind of law that applies to uh, to to maybe it, to applies to many all the things. Mm -hmm. For example, um, let's take an example of uh, gravity force, uh, which is uh, force equals m1 times m2, some constant over r square, right? So. Once you establish this formula, then it means it, it applies to all masses. So this, uh, I think, resonates uh, what we were talking about um, uh, as the three modes of um, pramana, uh, inference, which is the pervasion. So pervasion means uh, so you can apply to all uh, cases. Uh, but clearly, according to physics, you cannot check each and every case of mass, right? But however, you can uh, have pretty uh, higher level of confidence and certainty in this formula, because as far um, as the experiments are concerned, uh, it works pretty well. But of course, you cannot have 100% certainty that one day, uh, um, one type of mass will not uh, follow this law, uh, does not apply. Uh, this law will not apply to uh, one individual case. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in Buddhist, uh, so, but in order to establish this um, um, law, you start with a uh, limited number of examples, limited number of sample. And uh, investigating limited number of sample, you are able to establish this law. And, uh, and the way science does uh, this investigation is mostly by inductive, inductive reasoning. And I would like to um, uh, talk a little bit more about inductive reasoning and association, uh, co correlation and association. Right? And uh, so according to... Uh, uh, so some of the methods that scientists use when they establish certain law is by observing a limited number of samples and uh, applying it to um, general cases. And I would like to talk a little bit about associations. So uh, according to um, stati statistics, there are four types of association. Um, uh, one is spurious association, where you have um, two, two phenomena associated with each other. Uh, but does not necessarily have a causal connection, but have common cause. And uh, the second type of association is um, uh, statistical interaction, where one cause affects the result, but uh, this, the third type of cause, uh, when you control for the third type of cause, the effect changes. And, um, uh, this fourth type, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and then the, the uh, then there is a multiple cause, which are statistically independent. Two causes can have effect on the result. And um, um, my my question would be: um, Can we use this type of uh, inductive reasoning to establish maybe some of the um, some of the theories in Buddhist epistemology as well. So, thank you. Did you want to... Uh, 
Sure. I just wanted to make a comment on one aspect. Uh, I'm not able to comment on whether we can use those principles of statistical reasoning applied to Buddhist philosophy. But I am interested in the fact that scientists have so much confidence in the generality of their conclusions. So having measured the behavior of objects under gravitational fields, most scientists are quite happy to then say, uh, to generalize and say that this will always be the case in all times and places unless there's some other intervening variable. And I think myself that this is an example of a, an assumption or a guiding principle that scientists bring to their work. And the principle is we believe that nature acts consistently with itself. We do not believe we live in a kind of chaos. If we had one of those figures that His Holiness was referring to over lunch, one of these uh, demonic powerful figures who came in and fiddled with nature all the time and changed the rules, the kind of science we do would become impossible. I mean, you just would not be able to establish any reliable general conclusions. And science is really committed before it ever enters the laboratory or the field. It's kind of committed to the notion that we live in a cosmos and not a chaos. Uh, so it's an extra scientific principle that I think helps science to get where you say it goes. Can I add a few, Sir, a few words? Yeah. <coughs> when I think, <coughs> in a certain way, that the, the, the point, the argument between this uncertainty and certainty, I think uh, in Buddhism also, we say all of us agree that this, this is a table. We all agree 100%. Right? But in Buddhism, when you talk about the pervasion, but still the possibility of this, uh, this not being, uh, what you call it, table is also possible. The possibility is there, right? So although the certainty of the, this being a table is there, but the possibility is also there that not being certainty. So I think it's a little bit of, uh, what do you call it, a semantic uh, problem? So here. certainty, so one of the questions is what does certainty mean? Julia, please. Can I just ask a question after? Yeah. You say what you were going to say. Well, I was going <laughs> to. Um, uh, the question of what certainty means. One way in which certainty gets conceptualized is is infallibility. It's impossible for me to be wrong, which was in the translation of the. Do you think some of the, it, it, the that the inferences have to be such that it's impossible the conclusions are wrong given the premises? Because what I'm hearing from Love saying is that. A pervasion, and, and this sentiment as well, it has to be very reliable, trustworthy, but not to the point where it's impossible that that's, I'm wrong. Yeah, that's the question. That's the left, question. Left yeah. Yeah. open to, <laughs> yeah. for yeah. discussion. Yeah. But in some of the texts, uh, they say, uh, So generally... Ex exceptions are always there. Exceptions are always there. So it's not infallibility. All right, Julia. I have the same question kind of in reverse. So valid cognition or infallible knowledge, um, we have that in the West too. We often associate it with mathematics. We talked about that a little bit last night. But we think of the domain of valid cognition as very narrow then. Um, so definitely maybe in math, probably not about the natural world and almost certainly not about our inner lives. Um, so can you say a little bit about um, what you take in, in Tibetan Buddhism as the domain of valid cognition, because I think that would help many of us um, mm. get a sense of how strong the certainty has to be, um, kind of as a counterexample. Actually, let, let you guys have it. Um, Is there so, a domain where it has to be yeah. um, without, without doubt, or is in all reasoning? Is it possible to have a doubt about the conclusion given yeah, the truth so of the premises? I'd, I'd like to um, clarify a few things. So um, uh, the, the very word uh, pramana, which is tsama uh, in Tibetan, and the Sanskrit word pramana means actually to, um, to know or to measure uh, the jawa. Rub the jaw and I think it's a very similar uh, to Dr. Uh, Dora. You, you mentioned completely 
a certain knowledge. Yeah? It, it's, it's a similar with the Buddhist use this term, a valid cognition. But this, yeah, but the question is, uh, does it really mean that excluding all the possibilities of that this might be wrong? So that's the question. But firstly, I would like to uh, highlight a little bit on this term. So pramana means to know or to measure. Uh, and uh, there's uh, another term called prameya, which is the object of the pramana. And that applies to essentially uh, all phenomena. So I would say that um, either through direct knowledge or either through inference, uh, if anything exists, it must be the domain of uh, inference or domain of uh, direct perception. Uh, however, um, the, the, the way we establish uh, something through inference may differ uh, according to what types of uh, phenomena are we talking about. Uh, so my colleague talked about the three different domains of uh, prameya, uh, which is the manifest prameya, uh, slightly manifest prameya, and uh, very hidden slightly hidden Pramaya and very hidden Pramaya. And according to the text, uh, uh, manifest things uh, uh, can be discovered through direct perception. Um, uh, slightly hidden objects can be uh, discovered through um, inference. And uh, the very hidden uh, things can be discovered by uh, what we call Ichigita and the Stigmata. Uh, maybe, maybe a common language would be third reliable source. What's being told by yeah, what's being told? Yeah. Oh, so there's a social dimension to that. Interesting. Um, Chris. I, I wanted to take it in a slightly different direction, maybe, and in, into the real, really real world, <laughs> the gritty world. Um, John made a convincing case that you know the objective science as an individual is a myth, but what we're seeing in the Western world is an attack on science as, a cult, as the culture of science. In other words, the objectivity of the enterprise is being questioned and the veracity of it. And that's a different level of suspicion and skepticism of science that's quite dangerous. So in a world where we're t more and more tightly bound and underpinned by technology and science, we see most of the Western countries retreating from including science in their decision making. Less than half of the OECD countries have a science representative at the cabinet level. So I think this is a problem because, you know, if we lose the enterprise as a whole, if it's considered tainted, despite the fact there may be individuals who have biases or political beliefs or opinions, then that's a problem. And I'll, I want to pay incredible acknowledgement to you, Your Holiness, because if I asked how many other former heads of state and current leaders of a major world religion would be so strongly supportive of science anywhere else, I know the answer is this answer. So it's a problem, I think. And I'll, I'll just give one example just to make it a little more cutting. Um, most people are ignorant of the because of deficiencies in science education, the fact that scientists don't have seats at the table of the incredible advances in genetics in the last few decades. Those, and then, on the other side, we live in a world where there's huge amount of discrimination, prejudice, leading to killing based on race and culture. But this genetics research has told us that if, if we took some of His Holiness's DNA and compared it to someone born in the same small Tibetan village you were, the genetic difference is larger than between your DNA and my DNA, a Scottish person, a Caucasian, which belies the whole issue of race and culture as being of any importance in biology. But most people are ignorant of this, and so they discriminate, and there's prejudice, and there's killing. And so science has an obligation to be in this conversation vigorously and also to push back against being marginalized in the political discussions. Hmm? Oh, 
ठीक है छोकर चोट करे था आई बिलीव साइंस आई ओफन इज टेलिंग आई एम हाफ बुद्धिस्ट मंग और मे बी समेट बुद्धिस्ट फिलोसोफर वन इज हाफ साइंस साइंटिस्ट so the uh, the politicians or in politics i think they simply carry so activities according their own vision their own wish so irrespective whether realistic or not so that's why is there are so many sort of conflict uh, i feel i think scientist genuine scientist the open minded and then you see uh, any sort of anything remain more skept skeptical skepticism skepticism then investigate investigate so through investigation you will understand the reality and also i often is telling the way to research also you see we should follow uh, three dimension four dimension six dimension in order to know the reality just from one dimension you cannot see the reality without knowing the reality any your effort become unrealistic so many politician i think they want something very big but often fail because their method is unrealistic <laughs> i think politicians or even religious person pursue their own sort of or say they kasa a profession more scientific way it automatically become more realistic so that's my view then i think uh tunjolo tongsam medin shola matongsam sa kunis tiuka mm so dala tiuda tunjolo tongsam medin shola matongsam for example if you use this logic of uh, proving uh, any condition phenomena as impermanent and then you take an example and simply seeing something in the example which is conciliar conciliatory to what you want to establish and then simply because of that you say that everything is correct and then simply contrarily if you have not seen the similar example on the contrary example and because of that you you deny that completely then that becomes uh, a kind of uh, uh, biased approach chazang an jo anda chong shi ji ge dogjeo shi zene nge ba nge ba sa ji ji chung ge ba de ko ge shi bu shi bu shou du ba dan yin nge ba shi le de ge chi ge tang ba dan nge an sa dan er da ma ji de cheng ge da ชั้นแม่ชุงกีอ่าปมานาทรีดิชั่นส์ยูกินนัมชาตันละพะวยากีตันละพะวยากีอยู่คอร์ดะรังเซนยิดูชิชานะรังเซนเชียดะตาอ
这个人是一个人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的人的
is inferior. Then I argue, this is absolutely wrong. If we go together to a brain specialist, any differences about brain due to color, they will say no. Oh. And then also I sort of explain, in Tibet, we Tibetan, some narrow-minded, hardliner Chinese, they consider Tibetan brain is backward. Oh. So then, uh, we Tibetan, only, qu only question of sort of opportunity. When Tibetan also, you see, get the same opportunity, we also can be top. So I explain these things. Then, lastly, a long sigh, he responded. Now he convinced we are safe. At that moment, I really sort to of feel immense sort of relief. At least I change one's, one's, one person's sort of mental attitude. If you, you yourself consider inferior, then there is no possibility to further develop. So therefore, well, logically, a person who suggests other person, we are same. So I also believe we are same. Then cultural heritage, culture, culture somewhere. Culture. This not a biological factor. I feel environment and the climate. So like more uh, the Arab countries or or say the less vegetation, a dry climate. Uh, so according according to that environment, uh, and India and China, uh, and Tibet and Mongolia. <laughs> I think Mongolia and Tibet. I think even before Buddhism reach, I think we have a common sort of because of heritage somewhere, common life. Hmm? We are nomad, particularly northern Tibet. I think very similar, that of Mongolian, with some animal and eating meat, <laughs> and go <laughs> here and there. Whenever some obstacle come, crash. <laughs> There's, I think, over 3,000, I think 3, 4,000 years, I think we have that kind of common. So at that time, no national boundary. It's a nomad people go here and there. So I think in cultural heritage, I think many Mongolian cultural heritage, you see, in, among the, in Tibetan culture also there. We are very similar. And then most important, I think one important is the birthmark, Kasatimit. Blue. Oh, ka. oh, blue. Oh, birthmark, Mongolian and Tibetan and Japanese also. Oh common. Surprisingly, Hungarian, I was told some common sort of mark there. I don't know what's the reason. No? So in any way, uh, Karza, uh, so the different culture heritage, uh, culture not taught by someone, not, not as a religion, but culture, what's uh, Kasota? It's a, a natural kind of a pro, um, called outcome of a uh, huh? people. So, the environment, mainly environment. Because of that way of life, certain things that eventually create certain sort of unique cultural heritage on that uh, that area. Then, even eventually, people call there's this nation's culture, that nation's culture. The language, I don't know. We need further investigation. Linguistics. Like that. So that's my view. But in any way, I think, you know, practical level, we have to emphasize sameness of humanity. That's important. So scientists certainly can help, I mean, can support that. I see different people, different color, different system, not much matter. We are the same human being. 
uh, same desire to, to be happy person, happy community. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, once again about certainty. Uh, John said that, indeed that uh, many statements of science are uncertain. But on the other hand, science remains, and I think John also agrees, the best possible basis on which to act. And therefore, the people, and why? Because, in fact, there is all this uh, work of collective improvement and mutual criticism that makes science the best possible basis for any successful interventions. So the people who say that because of the uncertainty of science, then we should not use science for action are completely wrong. So I agree also with you. Could, and could I just respond to that? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. So I, I wanted to say something similar, if I might, uh, about what Chris said, because Chris knows, I, mean, I agree, and I think everybody around this table agrees, it's very important that we use science and the best scientific advice we can get uh, for a multitude of purposes, whether it be medicine or the conduct of national life. Um, and, I, and it is true that some Western countries are pushing science down in terms of its status. Uh, and how much pe uh, leaders are willing to listen, and that is not a good thing. Uh, I would just point this out, that I don't think we will help our cause, though, if we, and I don't think Chris was implying this, but I don't think we will help our cause if we come forward and make unrealistic claims about science. We must come forward, as Michelle just said, and say, Science is going to give you the most reliable, the best advice there is available on, for example, climate change. You know, climate change is such a good case where, unfortunately, the United States has proved very reluctant to accept scientific advice on climate change. And you'll hear some of the skeptics say, well, they can't be certain, or uh, there is some room for error in their predictions. And they say this as if this means the science is useless. Whereas scientific predictions about climate are bound to have error within them. They're bound to make estimates and use probability. It doesn't mean that you should ignore the advice. <laughs> it means you should understand that the advice has some uh, error bars incorporated in it. And this, we need to cultivate a better understanding in that sense of what, of what the scientific advice actually is. Uh, Michel, I wanted to finish his I, and I, last I do the, yeah, Go ahead. The last remark, it, it's about Sonam's intervention. Um, it, you, you very well listed the conditions for inference, the three conditions for inference, and especially presence in similar types and absence in dissimilar types. So, you know, at the beginning of the history of Western science, in, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 17th century, there was a scientist and a philosopher called Francis Bacon, and he made exactly the same statements. Presence, you, he called that the tables of absence and presence. And these methodological statements are considered as the introduction to modern science. So the rules of inference of Buddhism are amazingly similar to the beginning of Western science. So the, here again, there is a, a deep connection between the two disciplines, I think. Very interesting. Thompson. And I'd like to um, convey some of the uh, extremely important points that His Holiness made, which is uh, when we talk about certainty and investigate a certain phenomena, uh, according to Buddhism, there are two types of truth the conventional truth and ultimate truth. But uh, when we talk about uncertainty nature of scientific knowledge, 
it seems to be that you are looking for something intrinsically existent truth. And when you see that it is uh, possible that it can be refuted, you totally kind of um, throw away that truth. But according to Buddhism, when you, when you investigate uh, conventional truth, you just leave it as uh, existing conventionally. Uh, in in con oh, this is within Buddhist tradition. Because oh, I think the the identification is already that. Some I think something identification about uh Kasol mm -hmm. the Kasol the valid valid knowledge. Uh, in the Parmana Vatika Karika uh, and Dignas, you see, there uh, the individual believe nobody knows, but according to their writing, you see, they belong to uh, Sotantik, half Sotantik, and Chitra Mantra, Chitra Mantra. not Madhimika. So, about the very nature of phenomena. Uh, object as well as subject, you see, there are sort of different view. So now, Madhivika philosophy, you see, nothing objectively exists. Uh, Madhivika, particularly, Prasankika Madhivika. So, Yeva said, Jigden Chakvayakwani Yeva Chmata, Patatun Tsen Pena Yeva Chmata, Shia Chmata Khoksana. So according to Prasangika Madhyamaka uh, philosophical school, um, when we talk about something existing, it has to be understood in terms of um, how that thing exists by way of convention, but we cannot actually um, have something which uh, exists absolutely from the I mean, objectivity. Jasanga, uh, therefore, I think we uh, to because of description about reality according to uh, Pramana Vodhika Karika, I take for granted there is something independent, absolute nature. So these are more complicated. So go to deeper, more complication. <laughs> and, and we have to test through practice. Then you gain a certain sort of conviction. Oh, this philosophical view is actually Counter, counter force about our ultimate ignorance through only through experience, then you will get firm conviction. So that's sort of the analyze, then test, experiment. So final sort of answer come from experience. So. Ex experience is a little bit mystery. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, let's go. Ahead. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed those presentations on the epistemology, the methodology of Buddhist science, Western science, but I couldn't help think that there was something importantly missing in the characterization of Western science, namely uh, creativity and playfulness. Uh, and I wanted to know from the uh, speakers what they think is the role of creativity, play in the conception, execution, and interpretation of the uh, science that they do in Buddhism. So, yes, thank you very much for the important point. And uh, now I would like to talk about a little bit about uh, inductive reasoning as well. Uh, let's oh. answer this, this question: creativity oh. and playfulness. Is there a, a role of uh, creativity? What what role does that play in in Buddhist science? I really don't have a, a, a I word. Think, I think in Buddhist, Buddhist text, the creativity by the 
this morning, the sentient being, uh, still we uh, do not understand the real demarcation, sentient or non-sentient. But in any way, you see, we call sentient being because there is a nature, feeling of self. With that, the feeling of, I say, the pains and pleasure. So by nature, uh, we want uh, so happiness or pleasure, do not want suffering. That's the key factor. All evolution, we working, working, working. Even animal, because of that desire, but then gradually, I think the uh, sea animal eventually reach land. Then you see, they want to reach quickly. So then I think because of that desire and also some other element, the wind eventually is a come. So we can say that. But unsentient being, where? non nonsentient being, the evolution, uh, what is the causes? Uh, then Buddhists may have the vague answer, that's karma. ดังเจ๋อดังเจ๋อตอนนี้เออลงเจ๋อเจ๋อเซมเจ๋อเยี่ยมเยี่ยมซะเทียดแล้วว่างเกินเนี่ยนึกว่าตัวชาวเรศส
I like to say uh, something as he's already mentioned. Uh, according to the Buddhist uh, epistemology, they say there is a existing uh, intrinsic nature. In Sanskrit, it's called Svabhava. Yeah, I have or. Uh, uh, read some paper, the uh, paper written by the, some Western researchers, the pass on the Sanskrit literature. They say Swabhava means intrinsic nature. So uh, 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 Nagarjuna and the, uh, Damarkirti, those uh, uh, scholars of Nalinda tradition, uh, Nalinda though, uh, they always mentioned like emptiness of Swabhava. Not uh, so, so when they uh, in Sanskrit they read it, uh, uh, like this, uh, say like this, Savadama uh, uh, Shunyas. So uh, in quantum mechanics they say uh, also uh, uh, Niels Bohr say the ob there's a no objectively existing. Is it? In, in your slide also you mentioned, uh, uh, you say, objective scientist. So I think maybe uh, Niels Bohr might be obje a subjective scientist. <laughs> I think we have to leave that as a question because we're, I'm getting the cut sign from the producer here and I think we're gonna have to close this session down. Thank you very much everyone. This has been a, a very, very useful and meaningful conversation. I think Conventionally. Conventionally, yes, there is object and subject. Uh, if so, we uh, further investigate what, what object, what subject, you can't find. So I think we, both Buddhist logic and science, science both you see, try to find what is the reality. Well, finally, we can't find because of Subhava. Okay. 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 Oh. 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 Of course, I cannot claim I have some sort of deeper experience, but there is some small experience that through experience, now I, I have sort of hundred percent of conviction that wisdom which understand ultimate reality, nothing there, that really direct so the, so antidote, counterforce about wrong perception. Actually, now that one scientist, uh, one American scientist, uh, Aaron Beck, he, I think uh, I, uh, several times I mentioned Aaron Beck when I first met more than 10 years ago, his age already 84 year old. Uh, he's not a religious person. Uh, no question, not, no, no Buddhist, not Buddhist. See, he, a scientist, uh, dealing with people who mentally some sort of, uh, cause of the unrest, re rest, cause of disturbances due to anger. At least I think he uh, helped uh, he deal or with such sort of patient, I think at least uh, three, four decades. Then he take one conclusion. He made one conclusion. When we develop anger, uh, I think we Tibetan as well as Mo Mongol, Mongolian, uh, quite similar, quite tough. <laughs> so when we develop when we develop anger, the object appears something very negative. But he says, that negativeness, 90% of that, that negativeness is mental projection. 
So that's exactly uh, Nagarjuna stated that. So that another word, that sort of I think mental projection develop on the basis of you believe or uh, on the on the on the basis of appearances. Appearances is fault. Because false way, false. Reality, no, because to a member. Reality, reality means that there are, there are nothing that has intrinsic or objective existence. Hmm? But appearance, completely different. Appearance or something objectively there. So that is the basis of exaggeration. 90% of mental projection develop. So once you develop, ah, nothing exists independently from the object. Then these false, or say the view or perception, reduce. So anger, hate, anger, and uh, attachment become very weak. So that's we Buddhist, this philosophy, use uh, for counterforce this destructive emotion. So I'm wondering. Uh, I think once I mentioned to you or not, no? I have sort of, uh, I, I have sort of, what is it, keen in terms of the desire, desire or interest. Those quantum physicists not only sort of uh, understand intellectual level, but fully convinced nothing objectively exist. The such a scientist, they are not thinking that theory in order to reduce a negative emotion, but simply because of that conviction, now nothing objectively exists. They are, so the emotional level might be some differences. That I'm wondering. Of course, any scientist, if you have some sort of uh, interest, please, on behalf of me, please observe those genuine because of the quantum physicists in their daily life. You see, uh, their sort of emotion, rough emotion, same or a little bit less. That I, I really want. <laughs> <laughs> then I think there one story uh, in Lhasa. You see, Kaza, how old are Kaza? The place for the circumambulation. Mm -hmm. uh. So, someone, you see, uh, uh, went there, and then beside the road, as some person, someone, he says, looks, meditate. And that person is asked, uh, what you are doing? What meditation? He say, meditate on or tolerance. Then that person use very negative word to that person. He immediately responds. And then, the, the, uh, word, the uh, word is a little bit nasty because when he was asked, what are you meditating? He said, I'm meditating on patience. Then he said, if you're meditating on patience, you eat my shit. <laughs> <laughs> then he immediately responds, <laughs> then, then he said, you, you, you take that back. <laughs> Therefore, similarly, those who see, I think, scientists who fully convinced nothing objectively exists, then, you see, try to create some sort of, of irritation. Then, whether his reaction, normal way or some differences, we can see. Now you promise. <laughs>
You promised me investigation. Okay. This, so thank you. <laughs> then if if you come back with certain result, then I will I will give you some matter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.